Happy Wednesday. This is the second Insta Live this week as we focus on women's health and fitness. And today I am speaking to Linia Patel, Dr. Linia Patel, who is a registered dietitian with a PhD in public health with a special interest in women's health. And we are going to be covering all the different life stages as a woman and how you can eat better for those specific life stages. So feel free to send over and pop over any questions that you'd like to have answered on that. Um, We covered off women's fitness this week and I'm really looking forward to doing this deep dive around diet because Linnea has uh, worked quite a bit in this area and we know that diet can have a huge impact in terms of health around menopause, perimenopause, fertility, So we're going to unpack those various different areas. Linnea uh, works privately. Uh, She's based over in Italy where she has done her PhD in public health and also does some lecturing work there while she's finishing off her PhD or she's finished her PhD. Um, Linnea, can you join? There we go. Excellent. Fee request. Hopefully that's going to work. Hi, Linnea. Hello, my dear. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? I'm very good. I've been talking all day and I've been really, really looking forward to this chat the most, I must say. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. I sort of like need a little bit of a boost and a reaffirmation about what I should be eating as a woman to be better and stronger at my everyday job. I even just said that you were still on, um, you know, working on your PhD, but you have very much thank finished God, your PhD. Thank God I finished Thank that. goodness. Exactly. Exactly. Do you want to give a little bit of an intro of how you maybe got interested in the area yeah. of women's health before we do a deep dive on this area? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. And thank you for um, honoring me with your time this evening. So I got into women's health because I'm a sports dietitian. So I worked in performance sport um, for a while. And basically as a performance nutritionist, what you have to do is you have an athlete in front of you, work as part of a multidisciplinary team, and you have to get this person to be, be the best in the best physical form they can be so that they can jump higher, score more goals or win that gold. Um, And basically, as part of that process, I started realizing that some of the strategies I was implementing for my male athletes were working for my female athletes quite the same. So I would then go back and say, okay, well, what does the what do the guidelines say? What should I be doing? And I realized that there was actually a massive gap in terms of female specific guidelines in sports nutrition. Um, and so that, this kind of started my whole interest in wanting to learn more about it so I could obviously adapt my information uh, or the advice that I was giving to my female athletes. And that's how I really got interested in it because I started then seeing what was working differently for my male athletes and my female athletes. And then it's been since then, it's been a real um, learning curve because what I learned when I graduated as a dietitian 15 years ago has evolved so much and continues to evolve. And what we see in terms of female specific nutrition guidelines is that there is a sex data gap. So I'm a researcher as well, and we see this. And I think if I talk from a sports nutrition world, in the last five years, in terms of all publications that are sports and exercise related, only 6%, out of about 5,000, 6,000 publications, only 6% of those publications have focused on on females only. So what we're seeing is we're seeing advice that is very male biased. And actually, we are not little men. So we need to be tailoring our advice. Yeah. Yeah, spot on. It's interesting because I saw yesterday as part of International Women's Day, another researcher um, involved in the PREDICT trial was saying, you know, how in the majority of these trials that have been operated, men's health has been held up as this gold standard and that's been the comparison and of course they're complete different dynamics and doing research in women is of course a little bit more complicated because I guess depending on where we are in the time of month and fluctuations in hormone they're not steady as it is so it just makes sense that it's a bit easier to study a male subject but that absolutely shouldn't be the gold standard or the benchmark that we're following. 
Totally. And I think, Sasha, you've hit the nail on the head with three things. So physiologically, we're different. Metabolically, we're different. And there's different dynamics that we have to take into consideration when we're looking, when I, as a dietitian, um, I'm looking at working with a female um, athlete or a female client. There's the menstrual cycle. There's what type of contraception are they taking? Within the menstrual cycle, where are they at? Are they at their luteal phase? Are they, at their, are they ovulating? Are they at their follicular stage? Because all those different stages have slightly different nutritional requirements. I always say I love the fact that our magnesium requirements as women increase slightly in the um, follicular stage, which is why we have the craving for something sweet. So actually being aware of that and allowing yourself to maybe have some dark chocolate, 70% dark chocolate, which is super rich in magnesium, antioxidants and hits the sweet spot, actually helps so much because you're no longer fighting against something that's physiologically happening. So go back. So we've got the menstrual cycle, contraceptive pills they're taking. Then we've got age. Where are you? Are you in the reproductive age? Are you perimenopausal? Are you postmenopausal? Because all those different phases have different nutritional requirements. So one size does not fit all. And definitely yeah. the, the advice that we're getting in mainstream media, where it's kind of like, this is the advice we give for men. So you're just littler. So just ex extrapolate it. So just eating slightly less calories and the same will work for you is not right, quite right. And I always give the example mm -hmm. of intermittent fasting, for example. This has, for me, been an interesting area because when the research with intermittent fasting came up, I don't know, eight, 10 years or so ago, it was kind of like if done properly, it has huge metabolic advantages. It also helps in terms of body compositions and getting people to lose weight, the right type of weight. It has terms of anti-aging and all these massive benefits, right? So we were kind of just in the right context with the right people recommending it for both men and women. But what we're seeing from in the last couple of years from the research is actually intermittent fasting works a dream for guys. They do it properly, always caveating do it properly in the right circumstances. Um, but for women within the reproductive age, it doesn't work well. Actually, it's counterproductive, counterproductive. It makes us actually uh, produce more of the stress hormones. So we might be doing it because we think it's helping us lose weight. But actually, hey, it'll, you'll gain more fat doing it. Wow. I, I think, yeah. you know, on the back of yesterday and International Women's Day, we feel like this gap is really closing. And I think what's really fantastic is that we understand these things more and that the research is being the spotlight's being turned on this and that hopefully we can start to fill, up, fill the gaps in the science and our knowledge. But I guess yeah. it sounds like it's we're a way, way off. Way off. And this is evolving, mm. constantly evolving, which is exciting because we know more now than we've ever known. So that's yay. And for example, we can start adjusting and adapting um, the, the diets that women have, but we are learning. There is still a lot we do not know that we are still um, needing to, to research and find out and then apply that into what we're actually recommending um, as dietitians and nutritionists to the, the, uh, the female population. So based on what we do know, yeah. if we were going to just say generally, I, we'll go through different other life stages or specific requirements. But if you we are going to give some sort of general advice to all women out there based on what we know, what would you say, sort of like, heads up, heads top up. tips, ladies, you should be eating more of? Okay, the first thing I would say, top tips, ladies, eat enough. Okay, mm. super, super important. Um, and that's because um, basically our bodies at rest need, so Sasha, you need X amount of calories to keep Sasha going. If Sasha then goes and decides to do some cycling, because I know Sasha likes cycling, um, she needs to make sure she's eating enough for her cycling, but also for all the physiological functions that happen in the body. If Sasha does not eat enough for all of those activities, what happens is Sasha's body says, okay, she's going for another mountain bike ride. I'm going to fuel that, but there's not enough of the physiological process happening in my body. So I'm going to start shutting off some. And the first thing that gets shut off for us women is our reproductive function. Innately, the thing that drives us is protecting our reproductive function as women when we are within the reproductive age. And um, there's these uh, neuropeptides, are basically proteins that are within our body. So they're called, it's called kispeptin. And kispeptin molecules, women have much more kispeptin than men do. And that basically means we are much more sensitive to, en to not getting enough energy on board. And as soon as the research shows, after three days, of not fueling yourself properly and to kind of match your energy um, output, basically those signal, those 
cispeptin molecule starts signaling to your hormones to start shutting off some processes. So eating enough is fundamental because if you don't, then it's going to have a short-term impact on energy levels, concentration, and all that jazz, but long-term impact. And what I'm seeing more, much more now in my clinic, and this has been an evolution. When I first started practicing in high-end sport, the people I would see with stress fact fractures would be my dancers, my super um, high-end gymnasts, or maybe my marathon runners. Weight conscious sport, uh, maybe not eating enough. So yeah, quite typical of what they would experience. Now I'm seeing it with people like you and I, who are young women who perhaps have heard from somebody some poor advice about cutting out a massive food group, not eating enough because we want to look good, but we're still going out and running and training for a half, marath a half marathon or um, a big cycling race. And then as a result, over time, we end up getting susceptible to stress fractures because hormonal profile not working, as I'm going to say, estrogen basically, has receptors in every single organ. And this is why when you're perimenopausal or menopausal, life becomes harder because your skin becomes drier, your joints don't work as well, because estrogen helps lubricate your skin, lubricate your joints, um, helps you store um, uh, or have the right body shape, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, if those hormonal processes are shut off, then you basically start then not even having good bone health. And that's what we often start seeing as a long-term side, not even too much long-term side effect is like you get stress fractures. Even just from, I had a girl in clinic a couple of weeks ago, put her shoe on too tightly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, mean, I definitely don't want to scaremonger. It's not about that. It's just about really emphasizing fad diets. Ladies are just not cool. Cutting out food groups, ladies, for us is just not on. Make sure you're eating up and make sure you eat balanced. Balanced eating is the way forward. So not, cu not cutting out food groups and making sure particularly you're getting your carbohydrates in there because it seems to be cuspeptin is, is sensitive to energy balance, but also carbohydrate intake. And you know, the pressure's on every time you open Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, there are just genetically beautiful slash airbrushed people all over the place. Yeah. And you know, what your benchmark is about, you know, body shaming. And so, you know, I can understand why fat diets, why everybody's obsessed about weight and, and focused on that. But actually there's long-term consequences if we're not getting it right. Yeah. So eat enough, get balance would be my key. And obviously then depending on what else you're doing, what your goals are, if you're doing exercise, making sure again, because of this fact that we're so sensitive to energy, um, energy intake, you're eating around your exercise. So either you're eating before you go, or if, if you don't have a chance to eat before you go, you're making sure you're maximizing that um, window of opportunity post-exercise to refuel up so your body doesn't go into what we call a catabolic state, which is where it breaks down muscle rather than building it up. So this is another interesting difference between women and men. Men, lucky, lucky men. Like life is easier, isn't it? It's like their window of opportunity post-exercise is about three hours. Whereas for women, it's up to 45 minutes. Wow. So much shorter for us. So we've got to maximize that time, which is basically the golden opportunity where insulin is at its prime. Our body is primed to absorb nutrients and um, make the adaptation so that we get stronger um, and actually we're able to recover. And unfortunately, that just means that we need to be a bit more organized. But we are more organized as women on, on, the, <laughs> on, the, on the ball part. So maybe physiology does work for us. <laughs> maybe it was meant to be that way yeah, for a exactly. reason. <laughs> so it, looking specifically at one life stage, which is the pre-reproductive pre, pre stage, you know, if you're looking to have a baby, um, anything that you can be doing in terms of um, eating better to improve your fertility um, for those perhaps that are struggling with fertility issues? Any advice for ladies? I mean, this is, again, we could do another whole Insta Live on, on this area. Um, I would always say in terms of um, fertility being the right weight is key um, so making sure that that either you lose weight before it or you're st already starting to live a, a healthier lifestyle in general um, and then it, it goes back to balance to be honest um, if you're getting the balance in there you're getting the right nutrients there are certain micronutrients that tend to be um, uh, of higher importance, folate being a really important one. And that's why um, women who are looking to conceive need to be on a folate supplement. Um, other ones that perhaps are not mentioned as much are vitamin D. 
um, vitamin D again being fundamental because um, in basically the health of your fetus um, or the, the, the maternal um, health influences the, the fetal health. And vitamin D is super involved in gene regulation. So making sure our vitamin D levels are good, uh, even before we get pregnant, is, is fundamental in terms of, of, of that. And then omega-3 would be another one. But, um, you know, I'm, fertility is not my area of expertise, um, it, it, more so perimenopause, menopause is. But I know that when we're looking at the evidence, if we're looking at what specific supplements have been shown to be effective, um, the, two, the, the three that tend to get caught or the four that tend to get caught up are your folate, uh, your, your kind of um, making sure it's a methylated folate, your omega-3, your vitamin D and coenzyme Q10 in terms of egg quality. Brilliant. Are there some specific health conditions that are more prevalent in, in female populations that you know of or ones to kind of watch out that we can manage with diet more? Well, I guess it's all linked to the, if we're looking at reproductive um, function, it's things like polycystic ovaries, perhaps. I think that you tell me better than I'll know. You may know the stats about this. Are women more predisposed to irritable bowel syndrome because of the fact that we think they more? Are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. actually, there's, there's, there's definitely a couple of factors. Um, it's been really interesting. In fact, um, we put out a blog post on it yesterday. So for those of you who want to read a little bit more of this, we've got um, some info across over on the Field Doctor um, blog page. But um, yes, women are more likely, um, you know, two to three times more likely to have irritable bowel syndrome. And we think that is partly because of the gut brain axis. Um, I, you know, and we know that there's definitely some link with um, hormones, female hormones, and where they are, it, and that link that it may exacerbate um, this visceral hypersensitivity that we talk about, the sensation of pain that you feel it more. Um, we also know that women, of course, some women um, may get endometriosis, mm. and uh, women who have got endometriosis are more likely to have IBS than yeah. those that don't. Um, but we also know that women are more likely to go and speak to their doctor yeah. and to go and get a diagnosis. So that may also skew the data a little bit because they're just the ones that are getting more diagnosed that, than men that are probably sort of shouldering on and don't really want to talk about embarrassing bowel habits. Yeah, yeah. So Insta Cakes and Bakes, it said, I wish I was male. <laughs> <laughs> there are some days I do too. But then on other days, I think I, I wouldn't want to be anything else. Absolutely. When I'm multitasking. When I'm and multitasking. I think a lot of it, yeah, Sasha, a lot of it also is, is the more you learn to work with your body um, and eat for your body and move um, specifically for your body, then the more it does work with you rather than against you. And I think that's where the sweet spot is in trying to find how we can really get uh, messages out to out there about um, female health, women's health, um, and how we understand that one size doesn't fit all. I mean, even women, mm -hmm. you and I are different. So even though we have the guidelines, actually, at the end of the day, it's going to be slightly different for you and I, and we're going to respond slightly different because our gut microbiome is different. So again, bringing the idea that the idea of personalized nutrition is the way forward. One size doesn't and will never fit all. Um, we're learning more around what that looks like. Um, but a good starting off point would be if you really want to know how to work for your how to make how to make your hormones work for you is actually speak to a, a, a professional to make it more bespoke for you. Yeah, definitely. But I think the other thing is the landscape keeps changing, as you mentioned earlier, also as you age. That yeah. you, you know, you sort of understand, you probably get to the grips of your health and then some more challenges get thrown at you. I'd love to unpack perimenopause yeah. and menopause because I know that's one of your areas of interest and what can you do, you know, can diet have a positive influence in this? What can we do as, as women that are about to embark on that change or in that change stage or perhaps already in menopause? Yeah, massive. So I, I think we can do a lot. And I think um, menopause has always been kind of seen of as a taboo. So it, there's, it hasn't been talked about, it's been talked about much more now, which is fantastic. Um, but I actually think that menopause in, on average in the UK happens at 51, okay? But actually, if only things work like clockwork, but they don't. Um, it's kind of like um, like everything in life, you know, um, giving birth or um, 
waiting for a delivery. You expect it, you know it's coming, but it doesn't quite just come exactly when you think it's going to come. And that's kind of how um, menopause works. And actually what you do in the stage leading up to menopause is crucial for helping you thrive when you hit menopause. So there's this phase which is basically called, so menopause, uh, the definition of menopause is basically not having a menstrual cycle for a consecutive 12 months. Wow, it's as long as 12 months. Okay, okay. Okay. so that's the definition. Then afterwards, you're postmenopausal. In the period leading up to it, you're perimenopausal, okay? And that basically means that you might elicit one or two of the symptoms of the menopause, but not all of them. Maybe your cycle starts slightly going um, irregulated, or perhaps you're noticing that the exercise you used to do before feels so much harder, or you've got a little bit of brain fog, or perhaps your skin, your hair feels different. Perhaps maybe things in terms of vaginal health are are different. You have more UTIs or sex doesn't quite feel the same. You know, all these things that women perhaps don't even perceive to be hormonal changes and maybe just think, oh my goodness, um, I'm tired or I'm stressed out or things like that. But actually those are hormonal changes that might be um, linked to um, the perimenopause. So I've talked and I have I've not answered your question because I've forgotten what your question is, Shasha. <laughs> well, before you go on to, you know, talking about what we could do in terms of diet, I have to openly confess, I've hit perimenopause and I went through, I've had several of those symptoms and I put it down. I actually also had insomnia. I don't think you mentioned insomnia, insomnia sort of yeah. sleep, sleep issues. And I put it down to the stress of running a startup, starting yeah. a new business, um, not realizing I always thought that, you know, menopause was about hot flushes and it's, and it's way more complex than that. And it's not just like someone turns the switch off. You can still have, um, you know, periods, but these symptoms may appear and come. And, you know, it's not just, as you say, one day. It doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing to to, to notice is, is that, so over time, you are getting a decrease in estrogen. Okay. But actually it's not like linear. It actually is a little bit of this. So it's kind of like up and down leading to that as well. Um, So yeah, absolutely. What you do in your 40s is fundamental. One of the things that um, happens if we just talk about like, for example, body shape um, is is that as as estrogen um, levels get lower, um, you are more likely to lose more muscle mass. Also the fact that testosterone levels also dip. Um, So your body composition changes or perhaps the way your body shape is changes. Um, And so making sure that you are perhaps changing your diet, so you're eating enough protein, you're eating the right type of carbohydrates, you're doing the right type of activity and getting yourself in good habits so that you're doing that within your 40s sets you up later on when you're actually uh, menopausal or postmenopausal. So fundamentally, I mean, you could change the way that you're doing um, things in terms of what you eat in terms of macronutrients, the carbohydrate, protein, and and your fats, but also you can change um, by including some things which we call functional foods. Um, So for example, when we look at um, epidemiological research, um, so this is basically research which look, looks at patterns and ha- uh, dietary patterns and then links it to, to outcomes. We see that people in the East tend to um, not struggle as much in terms of the menopause, in terms of hot flushes, um, particularly. And that's because they have higher intakes of, of soy based foods. And within soya, you get phytoestrogens. And so phytoestrogens are similar to estrogens, um, but they're plant-based and they're much weaker. But actually, the research shows that if you have 100 milligrams of phytoestrogens every day, that actually helps decrease your hot flushes. So it's these type of foods. um, Soya would be one. Lignans would be another. So flaxseed being being the highest in in lignans. And things like bean sprouts and things like that. So there's top foods that you can actually start incorporating into your diet earlier on that help in terms of that hormonal uh, change that's actually going to be happening. So you've mentioned soya. Um, I think good to sort of talk about some of the negative thoughts that people have about soya. is soya good or bad for you? Because it you know, implies it seems that it has got some good stuff going for it in terms of phytoestrogens, but I, I know some people are nervous about eating it. Yeah, great food. Um, it's a top food for most people. 
Um, and the, so I guess people get scared of soya because of these phytoestrogens, which have estrogen-like properties. So they bind to the estrogen receptors and they do elicit some of the responses that we see with the hormone estrogen, but at a much, much, much weaker uh, um, level than, than the um, hormonal estrogen that we have inherently in us. So for example, my rugby players would never want to take a soy protein because they would say, oh, Lenny, I want to build muscle. I don't want to be taking in something that gives me estrogen, you know? Um, but actually, the research shows that even guys taking in estrogen, that doesn't have a negative effect on their um, estrogen levels. And I'm assuming, you know, not, you're not going to be eating like 20 pro soya protein shakes. Again, all of this with nutrition, it always comes down to balance. So you're not going to be overdoing it if, if it's moderate. And moderate basically means if you're having two or three portions of soy-based products, maybe that will probably be more, I'd be recommending that for perimenopausal women. But if you're having one or two soy-based products every day, that's absolutely fine to be having. And that won't necessarily affect testosterone levels or have any negative effects. But if you have a history, if you have a family history of an estrogen dependent breast cancer, and if you have thyroid issues going on, then that is um, a reason to get in touch with your GP to make sure that they're giving you the thumbs up or not, because that's more a medical issue than um, a nutritional one. So you've mentioned phytoestrogens. How else, what other health, um, what other changes can you make to your diet to support better health going through the perimenopause through time? Balancing your blood sugar levels. Mm. Pivotal. So what tends to happen um, with estrogen? Estrogen basically changes the way that we store fat and we also metabolize glucose, which is why postmenopausal women tend to be more at risk of getting insulin resistance. So basically means they find it harder to, um, to manage their blood sugar levels. So they're more at risk of diseases like diabetes. So optimizing blood sugar control makes your world a much happier place just in general in terms of your energy levels how mental performance how you're thinking um, but also in terms of um, weight management perhaps but also in terms of your risk of diseases that then are, an, are a side effect of, thing, of estrogen um, decreasing as well so learning learning how to balance your plate out making sure that you're getting um, you're getting that balance at breakfast, lunch, and dinner most of the time. Um, and not necessarily just, again, cutting out food groups for the sake of cutting out food groups, um, but trying to get that balance in there. Can't emphasize that enough. And so that means changing the type of carbohydrates you're eating. So perhaps if you're going for refined mm -hmm. carbohydrates all the time, making that swap and going for whole grains, and then also looking at portion sizes. And with that also kinds of mindful eating, right? So you can eat you know, slow GI, slow release carbohydrates, but if you're eating massive amounts too quickly, then also that is not necessarily great for your blood sugar levels. So it's always, always kind of about that balance, that mindfulness when it comes to um, healthy eating. And what about cardiovascular disease? Because um, women who have gone through, the, through to the menopause are, as I understand it, more susceptible or at risk of cardiovascular disease because they no longer have the protective effect of oestrogen what can they do to sort of t tackle that with, with diet? Yeah, so that happens because, again, estrogen protects our cholesterol levels. So suddenly you'll get a woman who always had normal cholesterol levels and suddenly she's perimenopausal and her cholesterol levels go, go right up. Um, so, again, when we look at um, nutrition for cholesterol, it's good old soluble fiber is key. Um, so porridge, uh, eating porridge more regularly um, and things, I always say things that look slimy because that's where I always tend to think that soluble fiber is found higher in. So your blue, your berries, your mushrooms, your lentils, um, your oats, including those type of foods in your diet is good. Um, one study actually showed a handful of unsalted, unroasted nuts reduces your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol by 10%. Not a, not a bad habit to get into. Afternoon snack, piece of fruit, handful of nuts, you're rocking. Um, and then um, what else? Fight, you know, get, getting that balance in there, making sure you're getting the, the right type of phytonutrients and antioxidants is key. Um, but also making sure that um, moderate intake of sugar, alcohol, and moving. Cardio, so if, if it's cardiovascular disease, the stronger your heart, the more my heart muscle, the whole more heart muscle it's got, the, the more efficient it's, it's going to be. So making sure you're getting the physical activity element in there as well. Well, Linnea, so much more I want to unpack. I can't believe the half an hour has already gone. Oh, really? I think we need to do a specific session, just just one Insta Live, and actually focus on sort of like perimenopause and menopausal health. So I think Absolutely. let's put that one in the diary because this is fantastic and I have so many more questions. But 
to summarize, um, yeah. it seems for women, um, you know, not fasting, uh, just, you know, making sure they're eating balanced, you know, yeah. not too much in a calorie deficit. Yeah. If you want to have some chocolate and you're feeling it, maybe there's a reason because it's time of the month. Yeah. Porridge is all good. Slimy food, soluble fiber, way to go. Soya, handful of nuts and, um, did I catch everything there? You've, you've done well. You've done done Lots of well. fruit and veg and yeah. whole grains, keeping your blood sugars steady. And just getting the protein in there as well in terms of, um, yeah, muscle mass. Fantastic. Fantastic Thank summary. Thank you so much. I've My really pleasure. enjoyed this session. Hope you all have. Thanks so much for, for joining us. And we're going to make sure to get Linnea back on so we can unpack a little bit more of this stuff. I, I just feel like we've just scratched the surface. So we're definitely going to come back on this one. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sasha, for having me again. Awesome. Take care. Have a nice Bye. evening. Bye, everyone.